Well, we are still in 2 Kings. And uh, we're working through the story that's it's actually in the tail end of uh, chapter 6 of 2 Kings and into the first part of chapter 7. And uh, probably just to kind of get ourselves up to speed, if nothing else, get my brain up to speed, we'll just kind of read through the story again. And uh, so we kind of catch where we're at, and then we'll pick it up in uh, the, the ending part in chapter 7 uh, this time. I can make it that far. So let's pick it up. I think it's verse 24. Ben Hadad, Hadad, however you pronounce that name. We'll find out when that guy comes. That's those Hebrew words. Probably won't remember it. Maybe you'll find out. Now it came about after this that Ben Hadad, king of Syria, gathered all his army and went up and besieged Samaria. And there was a great famine in Samaria, and behold, they besieged it until a donkey's head was sold for eighty shekels of silver and a fourth of a cob of doves dung for five shekels of silver. And as the king of Israel was passing by on the wall, a woman cried out to him, saying, Help, my lord, O king. And he said, If the Lord does not help you, from where shall I help you? From the threshing floor or from the winepress? And the king said to her, What is the matter with you? And she answered, This woman said to me, Give me your son that we may eat him today, and we will eat my son tomorrow. So we boiled my son and ate him, and I said to her on the next day, Give your son, that we may eat him. But she has hidden her son. And it came about when the king heard the words of the woman that he tore his clothes. Now he was passing by on the wall, and the people looked, and behold, he had sackcloth beneath on his body. Then he said, May God do so to me, and more also, if the head of Elisha, the son of Shaphat, remains on him today. Now Elisha was sitting in his house, and the elders were sitting with him. And the king sent a man from his presence. But the, before the messenger came to him, he said to the elders, Do you see how this son of a murderer has sent to take away my head? Look, when the messenger comes, shut the door and hold the door shut against him. Is not the sound of his master's feet behind him? And while he was still talking with them, behold, the messenger came down to him. And he said, Behold, this evil is from the Lord. Why should I wait for the Lord any longer? Then Elisha said, Listen to the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord, Tomorrow about this time a measure of fine flour shall be sold for a shekel, and two measures of barley for a shekel in the gate of Samaria. And the royal officer on whose hand the king was leaning answered the man of God and said, Behold, if the Lord should make windows in heaven, could this thing be? And then he said, Behold, you shall see it with your own eyes, but you shall not eat of it. I'm going to stop right there just so we can kind of make sure we're all on the same page and get the context. In the English, there's some things you kind of miss here. I want to make sure that we didn't forget from last week where we're at. First of all, uh, the first question that everybody raises is when Ben Hadad comes down, because the first just before that says that because of the situation where the raiding party, if you remember, came in to capture the prophet, and Elisha prayed for them to be blind, and then he led them down into downtown Syria, surrounded by the Israeli army, and it said after that event when they got fed a big feast and sent home that the raiding parties didn't come anymore. And then you go to the next verse and it says, And Ben Hadad gathered everybody up and went stomping down there. And you go, how can that be? And there's several things that, that are in there that are hard to see. One is the passage of time. There's clearly a passage of time before that second took place. And the other one that was pointed out that I just stumbled across this time and didn't really click last time is the difference between the raiding parties technique that they were using that was not being effective and the approach this time is totally different. Before it was raiding parties sent out into towns in the periphery with an attempt to discourage and cause problems with the, for the government and now it is let's go and take the central city. If we take Washington DC out the whole nation will fall is the theory. 
So they've gone in, taken the capital city, made sure the king was there when they went, and how convenient the prophet is also there. And then we're going to sit there and we're going to camp on this thing until we take out the king, we take out the capital, and the whole rest of the nation is going to crumble. That appears to be the strategy, and it's a really different tactic uh, that tells you perhaps while they may have stopped doing the marauding bands, they decided next time we go, we're going in force. We're not going to be outnumbered by some little uh, excursionary group that happens to hit us off the path. Were they riding motorcycles? No, I think they were. Harleys, probably. You know, they're, they're a mean bunch of dudes, so it had to be Harleys. So, there we are. So they're coming down. And they have camped around it and besieged it. And last time we looked at the pictures of siege ramps, so you've got a concept of how long this, these things take. I mean, those things don't just get built up overnight. So they are down in Samaria. We've got our map up here. And uh, you will see that I don't have my thing turned on, right? There we go. Uh, you can find, see Samaria here in Israel. We've got the Jezreel Valley up here. And of course, the Sea of Chenereth, or Galilee, as you know it today. And uh, this part being chosen, remember when it was built there, because it's uh, defensible. It sits on a hill in the middle of a valley. It probably is a productive valley, so it has food around it. Probably has water within the city, being water is never mentioned as a crisis here for the city. It's food that's the issue. And they've camped there long enough that whatever food stores were within the city, and a city that probably was prepared for that, I mean, that's why you put up walls, that's why you did all this, is that you put yourself in a place where you could hold off an enemy for a long time. They have been camped there for a while, and this is kind of important as you think about what we're going to be studying this time. You have to understand the Sumerian army has been there a long, long time, and nothing's happened. We've got them snuffed down now. There are no little excursions coming out of the city trying to penetrate the lines. They've long given that up. Shoot the soldiers, they're starving. They probably don't have enough strength to go out and fight anyway. So they're just sitting there waiting for the city to die. Or waiting for them to kick the gates open and say, okay, we give up. So life is good on the outside of the city. We're relaxed, we've got our military encampment. We've set up a city outside the city, if you will, with all the infrastructure and all, you know, all the hitching posts are permanent. They've been there a long, long time now, and we've set up camp. And uh, their descriptions of the food issues are there for us to get a grasp of just how desperate things are within the city. And I have a problem. What, while these guys are building this ramp, why are the people in the city just letting them go? How come they're not taking them out as they get closer? They, they actually don't, traditionally, what we understand, they don't just do nothing. They're actually trying to, they'll pour boiling oil or boiling water, they'll, they, they shoot them. arrows down and they do all these different things. That, that, and then the other sides, if you go and study their, the siege tactics and stuff, which go all the way into the Middle Ages, they build all kinds of different things, that's where artillery comes from. They have these fields, maybe you've seen them, looks like a giant sling that pitches stuff up and over. Yeah. They would, yeah, the catapult deals, and they have some different names for them. And they actually have guys that have built them today to, to see how they did it and to practice doing it. And they can sling amazing weights. They would take and sling dead animals over the wall or corpses over the walls to try to get disease started within the cities, things like that. So all kinds of stuff going on this way, same thing coming back the other way they would have. So it's a back and forth battle. Probably even the sheer number of the, of the raiding army that was there and how they would have Yeah, an overwhelm them. Yeah. Yeah. Why don't you pull up the Masada picture again for those who didn't remember it or weren't here last time. If you got that photo of... of uh, Masadas give you a concept of how long it takes in the massive labor force that went into these things. I don't know in this case that they built any siege ramps, they just surrounded it. But you know, when you look at this thing, here's this huge rimrock wall here, and this is all man made fill. This entire thing goes all the way up to the top, and 
that humongous thing. I don't know, you see the road right there? And then I think there's a vehicle park right here. So you can see this little road around here now. And they hauled in, and I'm sure these guys built, it was a bluff like this. And they picked a spot and said, we're going to fill that in until we get to the top. And so there it is, pictured further back. Here's Masada on this huge defensible knob, and these guys found the one spot where it was the least high, and they, you can see where they were lining all this stuff, and hauled it and put it up there. They didn't do it with caterpillars. You've never seen the movie of the Masada, you know, of course, it was just a movie, but yeah. there's thousands of people and had yeah. catapults, let's see. And they were studying and stuff, oh, and they man. Stood, they got close enough. Yeah, it's got moving up. What did they do for water in a place like that? Apparently, the reason Herod chose this is because they had either springs or they were able to dig down or they tunneled or something. They actually had water inside of the walls of that thing. Mm. Yeah, it took a long time for him to build it, and then they were they held out there, obviously a long, long time. How many people are we talk about? I don't know about this one. I didn't study it that thoroughly, but I'm sure there's thousands of people involved there. Uh, and in those days, the army was supplied. Their families came along. Oh yeah. Them. Right. Yeah, you had to have everything. Uh, to supply food and water and everything. Now, this is an extreme example. Samaria is nowhere near as huge a, a hill and everything, but it kind of gives you a little idea of just the, the amount of time we're talking about and how intense uh, these attacks were. They didn't have smart bombs and bunker busters and things like that where they just go and go boom, boom, and it's all over. It took years sometimes for this to go on. So Samaria has been under siege, they've been sitting on them for a long, long time. By the time the food gets so desperate that uh, that this donkey's head, which is an unclean animal with very little on it, and we talked about last time in today's prices, it's you know, well over $500 for this skull with a little meat on it. And the other one, still greatly debated, is it really dove's dung, or is that the name for some little lentils or some little seeds or something and people are pretty evenly divided over saying it says it's dove manure people were desperate enough that they were even paying for dove's manure to eat. Well, That's hard to imagine. That many people the sanitation problem had to be amazing. Oh it must have been something. Yeah. You know? It's just yeah it's hard to even comprehend and then of course the king and these women calling out to him saying, help me, help me. And he's gone. Uh, two things you get to see here, a little bit of what's going on in the king's mind. His answer to her is, if God isn't going to help you, what do you expect out of me? Is this more part of that problem that's going on over there now? That's Syria? You, you know, I, you wonder if any of this trickles down to the same old stuff that's it's been going on for hundreds and hundreds of years over there. Yeah, battles it's back and going forth. on all the time over yeah. there. It's, a, it's always a battle in that for that part of the world has been historically. And and it's it's probably different now than it was then, but of course in those days you were this is part of the Fertile Crescent. It is the freeway between Egypt and Africa and all the wealth there, Europe up here and Asia over here. So you got this this freeway goes right through here with a huge desert out off the map over on this side. You got a desert over there, so that is the funnel. Everything goes through. So the battle for that piece of real estate has always been intense. With our transportations, it's different today. It has more to do with peoples and their hard heads and things like that, I suppose, than it did in those days. But in those days, it was economic as well. Maybe it is today. Boy, I had a trucker tell me all the stuff from France to Turkey. And he went down yeah. right through there. Yep. And he, he said it got so hot in the summertime that the roads got so soft that he had to put chains on his truck to, part of the to, to pull through the asphalt. Yeah, the asphalt that's so sticky. Lovely place for <laughs> camel, I guess. Uh, 
So here we are. Ron, is there anything on that mound today? It's just a, a hump. I think we had some pictures and I would, I've lost them somewhere. I had some pictures and it just shows a big, you know, what they call a tail. It's just a big hump today. I think if there was water available, you know, I haven't found anything. Several commented about water is never mentioned as an issue, and you would think that they would have built it. I guess that's looking down off of it, isn't it? If I remember right. I had some looking back the other way. You see, it's just a hump with some ruins here and a big hill that you can get a sense of. It was looking out and the mountains ringing it and the valley around it. But there must have been water or something, either wells or something something that they were able to get or you wouldn't put a city there without water that's one of the first security things you have so the king is is obviously saying you know you're in, god isn't helping us and you get that and you see that he's going god's not helping us here we are the chosen people i watched it last night a, a fiddler on the roof was on public tv and there was nothing else to watch so i watched that I haven't seen it since I was in college. <coughs> one of the one of the things that the main character says, he says, God, I know we're the chosen people. Couldn't you choose someone else? Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, just one time. Well, anyway, that's probably a little bit of what this guy is thinking. You know, we're the chosen people. Do we have to be chosen for this? Where is God? And then, of course, the woman comes with her problem. Can you believe it? Moms, can you... I, does this even compute? That you would take your young child, probably a little child, maybe a baby, kill them and eat them. It would be that desperate that, one, the society would be so degraded. We're used to the idea of a mother giving her life for her child. That we can get our minds around. We can understand that. Using your child to survive yourself is you know, uncomprehendable. It's just hard to even get your brain around. What kind of desperation, what kind of unbelief, what kind of deterioration in the society occurred with this pressure? And what must have been underlying it even before then? That this happens. And the reaction of the king is, even with, with that, is to tear his robes. Even the king now is, is upset. And you can see the pressure is building. You ever reached your point where you go, I can't take it anymore. That's where he's at. He is to the point, and, and you'll see that exasperation. One, in the, the ripping of his robes over, we've now gone to cannibalism. It's become so bad, we've descended into that. God hasn't rescued us. And he tears his robes, and they see he's got sackcloth hidden underneath. And you have to wonder, why? Is normally sackcloth on the outside. It's an outward sign of mourning. He's got it on like it's a rabbit's foot to solve the problem. It's hidden underneath. He's got it on so he can say he's fulfilled the requirement. But the heart hasn't quite got there. And the next thing you will see, let's find someone to blame. Did you see that? The problem is somebody else. It's not me. It's not my heart. He didn't understand that as Elisha surely has been telling the nation, if you repent, if you come back to God, He will relieve us of this pressure. He has promised to care for us if we are faithful to Him. This is because we're not. And so here it is when He says, we're going to find someone to blame it on. You ever been there? No. It's not my fault. This happened, or that happened. It's this, yeah, yeah, that way, and that's exactly. He says, "May God do so to me." In verse thirty-one, there, and more also, even more so, if the head of Elisha, the son of Shaphat, remains on him today. You go do it now. That was the command. If you grasp that command, it's like. I've had it. This is it. He's done. I'm tired of hearing him tell me that stuff. He's the problem. Throw him overboard. Let the whale have it. Whatever. Get rid of the person that's the problem and will solve the problem. Do you think that Steve thought that Elisha controlled God? 
it's 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 funny. I don't know how the mind works, how we do that, but it's it's like it's not like he lies us, controls God, but yet we think he's responsible that he's somehow if he can tell me the things that he has and do the things he's done, it's got to be his fault. If you don't think that's true, also when you hear stuff you don't want to hear from people you don't want to hear it from, do you get upset with the message they're bringing or do you get upset with the messenger? What happens to Christian people when they bring the message to the world that you know you need a savior? You're sinners and what you're doing is wrong and that's <laughs> sin in God's eyes and and it's wrong, but he has a solution for that, and it's to repent, to turn to the Savior and accept that price that was paid. When you give that message out there in the world that doesn't want to hear it, what happens to Christians? Man, it's awful. Suddenly you can't tell your message anymore. And in some places, we haven't quite descended to that yet, but in some places of the world today, you go down and you burn their ancient churches, and you kill their priests, and you... And you get rid of them because we don't want to hear that. Or you legislate that they can no longer do what they can do. That's going to happen. We're going to 
crazy stuff, because I'm going to put the screws to you until you turn around and listen. And so he's been telling them that. He says, it is from the Lord. Why should I wait on the Lord any longer? He recognizes where it comes from. What's the question? He isn't going to do anything. I've had it. You ever been there? God, how long does this keep going on? Lord, you can control it. I know that much, but where is the faith that says, I know it's in your hands. You do what you got to do. Teach me what I need to know. Is it like he's waiting to hear again from God to make sure that that's exactly what I'm supposed to do? And no, it's more like, God, when are you going to get with it and do something? If you're God, if you're powerful, why am I waiting on God? What is this thing, Elisha? It's like part of him a little bit wants to believe that something can happen, but part of him's rejecting out of hand that God cares. It's like he's. When you believe comes responsibility, and he doesn't want to take responsibility. Yeah. He wants God to do it and then get out of his way. Fix it. Just fix it. But don't don't make life hard on me. I've had it. I'm. Why should I? I mean, look, everything's falling apart. Why should I trust that God's going to do something? Elisha's saying he's going to do something. He said, I'm getting tired of waiting. But God was doing something. God said, you be faithful to me, and I'll take care of you. They yeah. weren't faithful, so God was doing Just something. Precisely the message, yeah. And he said, I've had enough. And I like Elisha's answer as we roll into chapter 7 there. He says, listen to the word of the Lord. You listen up. Here's the word. Tomorrow at this time, a measure of fine flour shall be sold for a shekel, and two measures of barley for a shekel in the gate of Samaria. This is a place that has nothing. They're eating bird poop. And he says, tomorrow at this time, all this stuff's going to be there. It won't be giveaway, but it's reasonably priced at the gate tomorrow, 24 hours from now. And you'd think the king and all his men would go, thank you, that's what we wanted to hear. And the guy with the sword that got sent down, the official that he said, you go get his head today, who's ticked now because he didn't get to do what he wanted to do is take that guy out, I'm sure. That's so money wasn't an issue? At that point? It was just that it didn't have anything. Yeah. What are you gonna do with it, you know? Yeah. Yeah, you got five hundred bucks if you're lucky, you can find a donkey's head. Yeah, you're willing to buy a bird and poop for fifty bucks a pint. Doesn't that sound exciting? You're desperate. Money is who needs money? You know, everybody says buy gold, you gonna eat it? No. I don't know. We never quite can imagine this kind of a situation. And the royal officer, there he is, verse 2, on whose hand the king was leaning answered the man of God and said, Behold, if the Lord should make windows in heaven, could this thing be? In other words, there is, you get this, no way. That's today's saying, no way. No way, I will not believe it. If God cut holes in heaven, it's almost uh, like he's referring to the manna. I wonder if he's even thinking about the story. Of if God did the miracle with the manna, there's no way this would happen. And no, no way there'd be so much. But he'd have to cut a hole in heaven and pour the grain in. And it, was, it was sarcastic. It was. Yeah. It was very sarcastic. He says, you are a fool. Look at it. What's he on? I? You're nuts. God can't do it. Total unbelief there. And, and that, therefore the response to him is, Behold, you shall see it with your own eyes. You're going to see it. Joe, Harry, whatever your name is. You will see it and you won't eat one. You who are starving even in the king's chain. I mean, he, they had no food either. You've been only ones that could afford the bird manure. 
you're going to see it, you won't taste one bite. And then we shift, go to commercial break, you come back, and now it's uh, growing late in the day outside of the city walls. So you're outside, somewhere outside the walls. It's the only place that these next individuals can be. It's where the lepers are, outside of the city. So we'll go back into Deuteronomy and the laws and things, how to deal with all this stuff. You will find that then they were found to have the skin disease. They are sent outside the camp, outside the walls. And we're outside the walls. It's starting to get late. And there were four leprous men at the entrance of the gate. Some little hovel they had, and they depended on the garbage that people threw over the walls and whatever is leftovers to survive. And there's not been much garbage lately. And they said to one another, Why do we sit here until we die? We have nothing. Why are we going to... Why just sit there? If we say, Oh, we will enter the city. Oh, there's a good idea. If we enter the city, even if we could, then the famine is in the city. There's nothing in there. There's no food in there. And we shall die in there. If we sit here, we're dead. We have nothing. They're not giving us anything. There's nothing to get. So, good deduction. Over there, across the valley, all around, over here, is this big encampment with all these Syrians. What if they just felt sorry for a bunch of old leprous men. Hmm. Let's go over to the camp of the Syrians. If they spare us, we live. If they kill us, we're dead quick. We don't have to lay here till we starve to death and die a miserable, pitiful death outside the city walls and they come and find our skeleton laying there someday. We just, and it's over. And the other guy said, hey, sounds good to me. So they waited until evening, and they rose at twilight to go to the camp of the Syrians. So they're sneaking over there. Kind of, you get that evening. It's getting dark. And so we're going over. We're going to be kind of careful about this thing. Approach the sentries or whatever and kind of, hello. Not just go stomping out there. And they got to the outskirts of the camp, and there's nobody there. This is really strange. There's no sentries. There's nobody out with the animals that would have been out on the outside. They used to put the animals on the outside as the first line of defense. You had to get through all their livestock and everything before you could even begin to get to where the people are. So it was kind of a perimeter that slowed down any attacks coming through. You hear the sheep bleeding before. It was time. And there's nobody there. And the reason there's nobody there is verse 6. For the Lord had caused the army of the Syrians to hear a sound of chariots and the sound of horses, even the sound of a great army, so that they said to one another, Behold, the king of Israel is hired against us, the kings of the Hittites and the kings of the Egyptians, to come upon us. Therefore they rose and fled in the twilight and left their tents and their horses and their donkeys, even the camp, just as it was, and fled for their life. Gotta go, how could, how could that happen? Remember, how long have they been there? A long time. They've been camped there months and months and months and months, maybe years, and nothing's ever happened or anything. They're all kind of relaxed, everything's fine. And you got a corner, and all of a sudden you're hearing. And you could just see it. If, if maybe started with just a few folks somewhere going, What's that? What's that? And they've been there long enough, you've probably lost their edge. How many people at twilight, late in the day, are sitting around with their armor on, their sword ready, and they are ready to go into battle at any moment? How oh, cheap. It's like, geez, did I leave my sword around here somewhere? I know I had it. Let's see, was it last week when we had drills? I had it then, and now I don't have it. And it's just panic and pandemonium starts setting as they go, what the, who could that be? What troops could it be? And their minds are just going crazy. And so they're saying, it has to be, 
oh gee which maybe hired the the Hittites well that's the folks up north that's kind of a general name for a bunch of the Canaanites that live way up north they can be coming down and as they were talking about that somebody else said well you know they've hired the Egyptians before what if they hired the Egyptians? Maybe they hired the Egyptians and they're coming up from the south and they're coming in up and then somebody else went, oh my gosh, what if they hired both of them? And then, I don't know, you know, I don't know, is, is it like Bickleton where you live? And it comes into the cafe and soon somebody's question about, I wonder if, turns into, did you know that? They've hired everybody from everywhere and we heard them come, they're come and pandemonium just sweeps through the camp. And I love the description of it. I mean, everything is there. They dropped everything. And later, we're out of, about out of time, but later what you're going to see is that when they send out folks to find out if they're really gone or not, they find stuff strewn all the way to the Jordan River. You're talking 22 miles of roadway littered there we go, there's our map. So we're at Samaria, over here, and they went all the way on the roads around to the Jordan and headed back this way. So they have left clothes, they've left you know, baggage, anything they took to begin with, the more they go, the more the panic has set in, and it's absolutely freaked them out. Everybody just forgets that they're the military and the great and powerful Syrians, and they just go. Who would have thought? Who would have thought? We're about out of time, so I got to hurry up and say, so what? <laughs> what do you expect from God? <clears throat> How much do you expect Him to do? What do you expect Him to perform in your life for you? Well, there was a young man who gave his testimony last Sunday. Did anybody hear it? It was fabulous. Yeah, it wasn't me. For one, it wasn't young. And for me, it wasn't excellent. But he did a super job. And he mentioned this verse in Ephesians. Chapter 3, verse 20. I can't even get there. I'll find it eventually. It says, it's kind of the summing up of his prayer here. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly beyond all we ask or think, according to the power that works within us, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Is that the God you serve? The one who is able to do exceedingly abundantly beyond, there's a Greek word study right there. What does that really mean? That means that the Syrian army packed up and beat feet out of there for no reason whatsoever other than God started a panic in their brains. Somebody thought they heard something and the whole thing just came crashing down on them and they ran. Now what does this do for the people in Syria? Or in the city? In Samaria? What all? Somebody mentioned that it wasn't just a bunch of military guys sitting around eating K rations, was it? Who was with them? Families. families. And what did families that have been living there for a long time have? Dishwashers, washing machines, ironing boards, the whole nine yards, right? Food. They've got food. They've set up home there. So everything is left. All their food stores, all their clothes, all their wealth. We're saving our lives. We're fleeing with nothing. Above and beyond all that we ask or think is what God has done. One other passage I'll read you and then we'll close. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9. Just as it is written, a quote from Isaiah, Things which eye has not seen and ear has not heard and which, not have entered, which have not entered the heart of man, all that God has prepared to those 
who love Him. It's way bigger than we can imagine or understand. And so the question for them and the question for us is, we're holed up in that city and things look desperate and things look tough. Where's your faith? What's it placed in? Is it a place your ability to store up food and prepare yourself and be ready for an attack? Or is it placed in your God? And when times get tough, do you go, oh, why me, God, like I do? Oh, I don't deserve this. My combine blew up again. When is that going to end? Or is it, okay, Lord, what am I supposed to learn? What is it I'm forgetting? Or what is it I'm needing to know and understand and learn? Where is your heart? Are you a Saul who says it's their fault? Or are you David that goes, okay, Lord, teach me? And I think that's the message for us here today in this. At least one of them is to take a look at our attitudes. Is it like the king? Or is it like Elisha who says, this is what God said would happen. And he said he'd take care of us, but he wants our heart. Chance for us to look at our lives this morning and evaluate where we're really at. This close. Father, we thank you for our time together this morning. And pray that uh, this amazing story that uh, in some ways gives us uh, just shivers even trying to imagine it, the desperation of these people. But at the same time, they failed to recognize even when times were physically good, they were in a state of desperation. They had walked away from the God of their salvation. They had left the God that loved them and made sacrifice or made the Passover as a, as a tool to teach them that He had supplied the Lamb, the one that would take away their sin, the one that would make them acceptable before Him to cause them to be able to dwell in His presence. And they had walked away from that God and they had rejected Him and refused Him and they were in that state of starvation long before the food shortage in Samaria. Father, help us to realize that today. Uh, tap us on the shoulder, knock us in the head, whatever it takes, Father, for us to see ourselves in the light that You see us. And give us uh, eyes of faith to recognize the God of our salvation and the great miracle that beyond all we can ask or imagine that's been done for us. And understand that while there may be physically difficult times as part of our life experience, that those even are created for your glory, our education, the increasing of our faith, that we would uh, store up those treasures in heaven Help us to look forward to uh, a future with you and a guarantee of a life that uh, glorifies and magnifies you and your grace. And is a testimony to all those around us. We just thank you for our time together this morning. In Jesus' name.